Hello, everyone. My name is Michael Steinhardt. I'm the technology editor here at CBS Interactive, and we're proud to present Leveraging Automation to Help Manage Supplier Risk and Performance. This is a webcast sponsored by Coupa and KPMG, and I'm very excited to welcome Sam Neely and Chris McClory to the stage. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about our experts, and then I'm going to run through some very quick housekeeping items before passing the microphone over to Chris. So. Chris is a director at KPMG, and he's the procurement and business services leader for the technology sector. He has extensive experience in procurement and operational management, and he's delivered a wide range of complex transformation projects for clients in the technology and telecom sector. Uh, he's joined by Sam Mealy, who's Global Vice President for Risk Management Solutions at Coupa. Sam, uh, over the course of a 30-year career, he's acquired a unique blend of supply chain, procurement, strategic sourcing, risk, performance, and compliance management expertise across a wide range of industries, from manufacturing to financial services. And at Coupa, Sam supports a team of third-party risk, compliance, and performance management subject matter experts. So I think you'll agree that we've got the right team to get us this story and I want to remind everybody that this is an interactive presentation so if you have any questions uh, hit the ask a question button on your console we'll get those questions we'll line them up and try to answer as many of them as we can during a Q&A portion that's set aside at the end of our webcast if we don't get a chance to answer your question live we will definitely respond via email and if you happen to be watching this on demand you can still hit that button and send in your questions, and you will get a response from our experts. And if you'd like to get any more information about our sponsors, you can hit the Related Resources widget, also on the right of your viewing console, and you'll be able to find helpful information about Coupa and KPMG and the topic under discussion. So with that, I'm very happy to turn it over to Chris. Welcome. Hey everyone, thank you, Michael. And um, so, good, good morning or good afternoon, depending on, on where you are in the world today. So, uh, thanks for spending some time with uh, with Sam and I. And I know everyone has extremely busy schedules, so we appreciate you spending this time with us. Um, so let's let's jump straight in here. Um, so what we, what we do is got a couple of couple of slides up front just to kind of set the context, and then and then we'll get into a little bit more detail here. So, I guess when we think about um, the future of supplier risk and and how that affects the procurement function, there's naturally a lot of disruptors right now. Um, you know, creating pressure not only on just supplier risk, but the, the procurement function in, in general. So we, we see these kind of key trends kind of coming through um, as part of that you know, overall downward pressure on procurement to know that you, you deliver more with less and, you know, drive more automation, et cetera. And one of the, the kind of, kind of, some of the key themes that we're going to talk about today that you're going to see kind of peppered um, throughout this presentation that, that Sam and I are going to head on. It's things like self-service as the norm. So how do we how do we drive a superior kind of end user experience and supplier experience um, where we can you know automate more um, and we can get out of kind of manual processes. For for those of us that have worked in in supplier risk for a number of years, um, everyone can probably remember you know back in the, the the bad old days when you know we did everything on spreadsheets and emails and and you know generally the the process was seen as you know you would you would enter a risk assessment in a process and then it would it would kind of fall into a black hole and it'd pop out you know kind of six months later with a rating and and you were still none the wiser about what happened within that process. So so yeah, so really kind of driving that ability to 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 be self-servant and also driving that ability um, for transparency and then driving that kind of automation as well. And naturally, then that then leads us to thinking about, okay, there, there's a lot of data that organizations hold um, internally that, that could be used, right? So, so there's a lot of data within your existing systems that can be used so that, that every time that every kind of every supplier risk or every engagement is not a new day, right? It's about maximizing that data and not having to go out and ask for that that data multiple times. So Sam, why don't, why don't you just talk a little bit then around um, you know how how we're contributing to value? Yeah, thanks, Chris. Well, as we go beyond more traditional types of value, where we're really talking about you know spend and managing spend directly, one of the things that I think is very timely now is how KPMG and Coupa are helping organizations really build resiliency into the business, specifically around supplier risk and performance management, beyond, say, a traditional pillar of spend visibility and control of spend, or from a finance standpoint, the ability to be able to invest at the right time. 
Today, we're really focused in on really managing that supplier risk and performance management in terms of how one might understand prescribed steps to quickly or proactively mitigate a third party risk, or how we can minimize risks um, across surprises that are occurring, you know, whether it's the pandemic we're facing today um, or a new crisis that we're unaware of tomorrow. So really what we're trying to do is to show you how you can build resiliency into your business beyond the traditional messages of spend control. Chris? Chris, you there? Um, Chris, is it possible that you're on mute? Sorry, guys, my, my phone dropped. Sorry, apologies. Apologies for that. Um, best laid plans and all that. Um, so yeah, let's let's talk a little bit then around the kind of future procurement and and where we see supplier risk setting within that future. Um, and what we've done, we've, we've kind of laid out our so so KPMG has spent a lot of time thinking about you know, what does the future of procurement look like? As we think about those disruptors and how they're creating that pressure, you know, what does the future look like and what are the kind of key components? And how that relates to our conversation today um, is we're gonna talk about kind of three key areas where we believe that this is particularly relevant for supplier risk. So one of them, which, which is probably pretty obvious here, is when we think about kind of supplier-centric procurement. Um, the, the supplier risk programs can be, you know, pretty heavy on, suppliers like you know and naturally you know kpmg is, is a supplier to a lot of organizations um so when we think about it from that perspective um you know supplier risk you know requirements and qualifications and, and how we you know submit uh you know like due diligence questionnaires and all this type of data you know that that creates you know quite a challenge so that there's got to be a way to make that that supplier experience better and we're going to talk we're going to do a double click on, on on these three components but but for supplier centricity we're going to talk about you know how, how do you become that kind of customer choice right so that's that's what we're kind of driving to there when we think about kind of customer centricity we're then thinking about how do you make that end user experience better right so you know there's there's kind of when you think about the kind of source to pay life cycle there potentially can be multiple platforms in play. There can be multiple teams in play. How do you drive that user experience where a requester who really is just, you know, they, they just want their, you know, supplier onboarded or there's contract done or whatever. Um, how, do you, how do you keep them informed? How do you make sure that it's an, an easy, simple, seamless process for them? And that then all leads us on to the kind of digital procurement platform. And, and Sam, I'll let you jump in here on that piece. Thanks, Chris. What we're referring to from a digital procurement platform, you know, goes beyond our traditional definitions of software as a service. What we're really looking for here is a unified platform that's going to include aspects of supplier performance management, specifically like third party risk management capabilities, like specific scorecards, but not only individually, um, unified with the other aspects of your procurement platforms, like procurement, invoice, pay, and expense. You need to go beyond a traditional platform and into the realm of managing risk and performance converged with traditional procurement uh, tasks and activities. Okay, excellent, Tom. So let's think about it a little bit in terms of what, what do we what do we mean by kind of customer centricity? So so as you'll see, the the, the role of procurement is is kind of changing, and one of those kind of components that we talk about just down at the, the bottom here on the um, on the left hand side is around this this kind of concept of, of being the kind of risk steward, right? That is kind of one of the components and one of the areas where procurement can add additional value, right? It's no longer just about making cost savings. I, I don't you know, I don't feel that, that cost savings will ever go away and that's very important. And we're, you know, we're, we're talking today about, you know, that conversion of, of risk and, and, and kind of business spend management. But the, there is a new role there around, you know, the, the kind of risk steward and, and ultimately how we manage that. And ultimately, how do we make that risk, as we talked about a little bit already, how do we make that process easier on the end user? How do we keep them informed? How do we keep them up to date? How do we manage their expectations about what's going to happen, how it's going to happen? So there's there's a key point there around keeping you know keeping those individuals informed, 
um, and also making life easier for the process actors. So how does the technology drive a superior experience for the process actors so they know when they have stuff in their, in, you know, in their queue, for example, that they have to, you know, kind of risk assess, or they, they know, you know, who's, who's next in the, the, you know, the kind of line in terms of, you know, who's going to be, who's going to be touching that, that particular, uh, you know, initiative or program or statement of work or whatever that may be. So, so there's a number of, you know, kind of key points when we think about, uh, you know, customer centricity. And then just as I, I talked about, we, we kind of feel like supplier risk and performance management now really needs to become supplier value management. Because what we're talking about here is we're talking about managing that relationship end to end. And there's a lot of kind of key connection points. So there's the kind of integration of systems and integration of data, um, you know, things like supplier managed storefronts, for example. And um, there's the innovation piece, you know, su suppliers, um, you know, some, some of you guys that, that work within, you know, the procurement or the risk and compliance functions, you probably hear suppliers, you know, saying, hey, I, you know, I want to, we, we have new and innovative products, but we don't, we just don't know who to take them to or don't know how to, to kind of get that into your organization. How do we have a conversation about that? So driving, again, more connectivity and more innovation, optimizing risk and performance. So, so balancing those, you know, those two components and having that integrated view of risk. So how do you get that view that you can, you know, basically see what, what are the risks I'm carrying or what are the risks and that we're seeing with this particular supplier and, the, and that link to performance as well. And then ultimately compliance. So how, how do we drive compliance um, and how do we make it predictive, especially in the current environment, right? A lot of supplier risk programs are now being tested in, in the current situation more than they have ever been. Um, and that's not, you know, having that kind of reactive view of risk is no longer going to be good enough, right? It has to be proactive and people want to understand, you know, how can they get those early indicators and early identifiers? Sam, I'm going to flip to you. Yeah. Yeah. And as Chris mentioned, really it's the technology that drives the governance and the adoption around these programs. And as Chris mentioned, if we're going to be focused around customer centricity and supplier centricity, we really need to have um, a technology platform that supports that. So as I mentioned earlier, going beyond kind of comprehensive business spend management, we really want to support the notion of the convergence of risk and spend management, where now we can actually take action on the insights that the platform is driving. But in order to get there, the platform itself has to be comprehensive. Otherwise, we won't get to that customer centricity that Chris was speaking of. And speaking of the customer, those are our end users. So the platform itself has to be extremely user-friendly and user-centric to be able to drive adoption for really all of our employees and all of our suppliers, right, which touches in on really the supplier centricity that Chris was mentioning. And to get there, the platform must be open, right? We talked a lot about integration. So the platform needs to be open. It needs to integrate with your ERP applications. It needs to be able to be easily adopted um, by our suppliers. And as Chris also mentioned, we need to go beyond reactive. It needs to be proactive. And one of the things that we pride ourselves on Coupa is the ability to provide prescriptive solutions to you, really driven out of the community intelligence that we've built throughout our customer base. Where the platform itself, you know, based on supplier conditions, risk conditions, performance conditions, will actually make prescriptive um, directions for you to take. And then finally, the platform leads itself to accelerated deployments, right? Before we were worried about doing things in months to years. Now these things are deployed in months so we can take advantage of them. So we're striving for a very comprehensive, open, user-centric, prescriptive, and a platform that lends itself to very rapid deployments. Chris, you there? <laughs> Make me lose you again? No, we're good. We're good this thing. Okay, um, there yeah, we are. So, <laughs> so guys, yeah. So guys, I know we've been talking kind of conceptually about you know what has to happen and extreme automation and data and all, and and uh, you know leveraging um, the platform, etc. But but now we're going to get a, a little bit more practical around. Okay, but but what does this actually mean, and and how do you actually solve for this this kind of puzzle? Um, so Sam, I'll, I'll flip back to you then, just to talk about the, the complexities involved. Yeah, Chris, using the word puzzle, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good term. Uh, supplier performance and risk management is like a puzzle, and it is a very complex challenge. Um, and we need to get it right, 
right? You, you need to put a solid plan in place um, because we want to strive to get to building these resilient businesses. Well, why is it tough? Why is it complex? Well, to begin with, we're dealing with multiple domains, risk domains, compliance domains, performance domains, everything from information security to any bribery, any corruption, sustainability, business continuity, performance management. And we also have to deal with a lot of different constituents that we're trying to please, right? I've listed regulators as a primary constituent, but what about our own internal auditors and our board of directors? And then to compound the problem even further, when we're dealing about risk and performance management, we're not just talking about entity or corporate level measure measurements. We need to get down into the contract and measure the risk associated with each individual relationship. And when we do that, not only are we looking at each individual relationship, but for those critical and material relationships that we have, we need to understand our suppliers, vendors, and subcontractors because we're assuming not only the risk of our third party, but also our fourth and fifth parties. So when you put these things together, multiple domains across a lot of different constituents with very complex relationships, you can see that this is a difficult challenge and we believe it requires you know, frameworks uh, to be successful. Perfect. Yeah, so so when we think about um, when we think about supplier risk and performance management, um, when I have conversations with clients, a lot of those conversations are around uh, yes, that, that there, there's technology that can solve you know a number of these issues, but we need a, we need an overall framework that, that's the kind of wrapper around that, if you like, so that we can fully understand how each of these different components, and and I think you know Sam used the word constituents how each of these com these constituents are actually working. Because w one thing when I think about supplier risk and performance uh, programs is that you're asking a number of internal functions. So even if, if we, we remove the, the, the complexity of dealing with the supplier and their parties, even if you just think internally about how you're gonna organize your, yourselves and your organization, you're asking a number of functions to work uh, together in a way that they may not have previously done so. Oh, and by the way, you're going to want to measure the efficiency of that overall process because you need them to work together in an efficient way so they can ultimately maintain the speed that the business needs. And, and for example, um, as, as Michael mentioned at the front, I, I work very heavily in the, in the technology and telecoms and FS sectors. Um, you know, th those, those particular sectors you know, need that kind of speed of sound, right? They, they want to do something. It's about market drivers. It's about being first to market. It's about having the latest and greatest product. So, so they, they cannot afford to be bogged down by, you know, very expansive kind of risk processes that don't work at the same pace as their business. And that's where you need that level of integration between the different kind of functional components. So I'm just going to head on these super light, and then what we've, we've got in the next slide, Sam and I are then going to take you through some, some kind of deep dives on just a couple of the areas. So, so risk exposure is, is one of the, the, the key ones for me, and that's really about aligning your supplier risk management pro and performance management program to the, the internal organization's you know, risk management frameworks and risk management appetite. So, so again, just talking about personal experiences here, you know, a technology company may have a significantly more um, you know, higher risk appetite, sorry, than, for example, a financial services company, right? Because they're, they're different entities, different regulations, et cetera. Um, so, so, you know, you, you have to make sure that you get those, those kind of components right. When we talk about process, I, I think I've kind of drained that one already, but, but you know, talking about how, how do we make the constituent parts of the process all work together, including those sub-processes, and how can we ultimately measure that, perf that, that performance of that process? And then thinking about, you know, kind of policy procedures, <coughs> The, 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 the carrot is always good in terms of getting people to do things, but the, but the stick also works as well, right? So there has to be a strong policy framework that's going to drive a, a kind of level of compliance. You know, people, people generally within organizations always want to do the right thing, um, but it's about making sure that they understand, you know, what, what do the policies say and how do those work? And then thinking about organization, this, this one is always a, is a kind of hot button. Who, who owns the program? Who owns the relationship? How do, how do things get, that get done? How do we get that integration? So again, the, these are kind of key components that, that when we're, we're putting together frameworks and, and putting together how that should work, you know, the, we need to make sure we get that right. One of the yeah, big, big Chris, topics, sorry, you go, yep. 
Oh, yeah, Chris, I was just going to add a comment to, to what you were describing around organization. Uh, and this can be challenging when we're talking about an overall pro program or framework because um, when we refer to suppliers, in most organizations, especially something that Chris has mentioned in terms of the high tech industry, if they have a tiered distribution model, meaning they're leveraging distributors or resellers, organizational, um, organizational coordination is really important because procurement often doesn't have control over a reseller or distributor, yet they are very important to managing risk. And so where a lot of bribery and corruption comes from is from our distribution and reseller programs. So if we don't have solid organization to manage across our lines of business, it breaks down you know, the program overall. So that's one thing everyone should be aware of is again, it's not only the buy side, the things that we're buying, um, it also can be on the sell side of our organizations as well if we're dealing with distributors and resellers. Sorry, thanks Chris. Absolutely, no, that's a great point, great, great point. So then when we think about um, kind of governance in terms of you know, how, how is the program governed, I often think about this as, as an example of like who, who can accept the risk? And who can accept, you know, and what is the severity of that risk and who has that kind of overall picture? So when we think about, you know, things like the lines of defense and, you know, how, how do things make their way through those lines of defense? Who makes those decisions? Is it like enterprise risk and compliance committees? You know, what is the severity of the issue have to be that it has to go to one of these committees? And how do we provide that when we, when we think about then information reporting and technology? How do we then provide that information? Like, where does that information come from? Like, where is it stored? And, you know, we're, you know, we naturally, yeah, you're listening to this, this webinar, so we have some strong opinions on where that information should be stored and, and how it can be, um, you know, retrieved and, and reports pushed to, to, to various different parties and, you know, governance committees and executive committees, et cetera. And, but naturally, these things have to come together. And then finally, just service delivery. Who ultimately does the work? Where is the work done? Is it kind of centralized? Is it a decentralized model? And again, that's important when you're talking about global organizations that, that have you know, multiple different locations and multiple different requirements within those locations. So, so again, just, just presenting you guys a view of, of you know, how these programs ultimately you know, start to come together and some of the various kind of considerations there. Okay, but let's talk about one of the components then just, just a little deeper. So, so one of the areas that, that we think about is, is when we think about this kind of, you know, intake and initial risk assessment. I think this is probably one of the most kind of critical parts of the process to get right and, and one of the most critical parts of the kind of risk assessment to get right. You know, if you, if you kind of over-engineer the initial risk assessment process, then you're going to have, you know, alerts and triggers for things that may not actually be kind of, kind of material to your business. So again, getting those different components right is, is kind of really important. The ability to, to kind of automate that workflow end to end, again, intake, um, you know, through assessment, through the kind of, you know, residual risk and ultimately scoring, et cetera. You know, how do we, how do we kind of get that right? How do we make sure that that, that, that piece, you know, comes together well? And part of that is, is really just about identifying that universal third party. So, so Sam's already talked about, um, you know, not only the buy side, but also the sell side as well, and, but also those fourth parties as well. So how do you, how do you get to um, your supplier suppliers and how do you understand, you know, how much risk exposure or not that, that, that you may have there? And then when we talked about, we already talked about kind of data and, and big data where is some of that data held even within your internal system? So the systems that, that you have right now, and how do you get that integrated view of data across all those different platforms or those different data sources? Again, just, just kind of things to think about. And then we talked about again, right? So, so kind of risk tiering in terms of, you know, how, how, do we get the, how do we get the user experience right in terms of not only the number of questions that we're asking, but the tiering and the weighting for those particular questions? Because what that's going to do is that's ultimately going to feed that segmentation that, that's so important, right? Because not all suppliers are equal and we want to make sure, and there's only, you know, typically what we see is there's finite resources to ultimately manage these programs. So how do we make sure there is that focus on the right suppliers who, ha who really present our business with the most critical or the highest risks? And, and what I, you know, the, the old term that we typically use is, you know, who has the ability to kind of turn the lights out, if you like. Um, so that's one of the components that we, you know, that we kind of think about. 
And then Sam, you want to just jump in here? Yeah, definitely. Um, so if, if we take a look at the ecosystem that Chris was describing in a slightly different perspective, um, let's look at it really from the life cycle and how we would actually manage a particular supplier. And typically the paradigm we're always talking about is including all of our departments, right? All of our lines of business. We're trying to break down, you know, the traditional silos where upstream processes were divorced from downstream processes, right? And again, this concept of converging risk and spend management together. So what we're going to do is collect information, as Chris had mentioned, from um, our various individuals within our company traditionally might be referred to as the first line of defense, right? We want to combine that, though, with information directly from all of our different supplier types, whether they're on the sell side or the buy side, whether they're traditional vendors, suppliers, or in the financial services space, are they agents and brokers? All of them should be included, right? The goal is to get 100% inventory across the universe of our suppliers. And then finally, back to the open concept, we need to integrate this information with external data providers, which are going to really provide kind of a triangulation or test the veracity of the information that we're getting from our internal employees and from the suppliers themselves. And what do we do? We put this into a life cycle process that truly is 360 degrees and repetitive. And it can start with actually the planning phase which really goes beyond measuring the risk of a supplier, but it really starts to talk about how do I determine the risk of the process that I'm considering to outsource? Should I even outsource the process to a third party or not? That's really where a life cycle process can begin. And then finally, we start to come up with candidate suppliers, our onboarding considerations, put them through a selection process where we actually are trying to manage and monitor and measure that risk through an assessment process. We're going to go through a contract negotiation process, finalize that contract, and then start to manage the supplier on an ongoing basis. And here's really where performance metrics become critical. Can I automate the measurement of the SLAs and the KPIs that I've put into a contract? And how do I do that on an ongoing basis? And how do I do ongoing monitoring? Right? Does my platform allow me to receive alerts, for instance, if the financial health score from a rapid rating breaks a certain threshold. And then in today's world, we do need to worry about managing the termination process. So many, so many of our relationships are with software as a service providers where we're holding you know, confidential or private information. So the process to break a relationship needs to be documented as well. But in general, when we're looking at the life cycle of a supplier performance and risk management um, process, we do need to go through the planning, due diligence, negotiation, monitor, and termination phase. And that's really the only way we'll break down the difference between the upstream and downstream processes and get a solid representation in our organizations for the ecosystem that Chris just described. Excellent. Thank you, Sam. So then let's let's think about that that kind of integration that, that that Sam's talking about, right? He 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 kind of took you through all the the different kind of process steps there. You know the kind of um, risk filtering, the due diligence, the contracting, the risk monitoring, and then ultimately the the determination or offboarding. So as as we kind of think about that, we then have to think about well, how do we integrate that process and those steps into the kind of overall um, you know procurement life cycle, if you like. Um, and one of the, the kind of key things for us is about understanding how those two processes, and, and particularly the risk process, how does that what we call then gate the procurement process so that we can ensure there's a certain level of control that you, 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 know, you cannot get bet, you know, between the processes, or sorry, you cannot get between the process steps you know, without going through a specific gateway. And as, as part of that, again, Sam talks about, you know, we, we need to automate this process as much as we can so that the participants and the process actors, you know, ultimately understand where things are in the process. And we've just kind of highlighted on this, like, you know, as I talked about earlier, there are naturally competing priorities here and different views of not only the, the kind of risk and procurement process, um, but also, you know, what, they, what their particular wants and needs are. So, you know, you have a requester on one end that, that kind of wants to, to do something and wants their, whether it's consultants onboarded, whether it's the technology selected, 
they they just want it and they want it now, right? And it, it's trying to it's trying to manage their expectations and give them that level of transparency. You've got the sourcing team who may be quarterback in the process, so you know they're helping guide the end user through the the kind of various steps. Um, they're able to see you know the the level of coordination, hopefully through the platform, of kind of where the different components are at each and different actors are at each kind of step of the way. You then have the kind of rest domain experts who are want to do their job in terms of you know, understanding and managing the level of kind of due diligence that's done and ultimately rating that level of due diligence. So taking it from kind of, you know, control effectiveness ratings through kind of residual risk scores. And then you have the legal team who are looking to ultimately see if they can uh, mitigate or manage any of that risk as part of those kind of contractual provisions. So that's why we think about, you know, being able to integrate the process in such a way that the risk process is gating that process so that each can each process actor end to end is able to do their specific role as effectively as they can, but also understands the various kind of pushes and pulls in terms of, you know, their level, their importance, sorry, in the process and their impact on, you know, speeding up that process or slowing it down. And again, that all comes back to being able to measure the efficiency of that process, because you want to make sure that if something is coming out as, you know, kind of low risk, and genuinely is low risk, then, you know, we're, we're hoping that that goes through the process at the speed of sound, uh, you know, and everything is, you know, everything is good and, and the person gets their services as quick as possible. But again, it's about managing expectations on the back end that if you are doing something that is critical or high risk, um, you know, like outsourcing a whole function, for example, or doing something, um, you know, that presents a level of risk to the organization, that everybody within the process value chain then get that opportunity, you know, to, to kind of add value and has the time to kind of do their job. And again, just managing the request or expectations as part of that. That's really what we're, we're kind of talking about here. And Sam, I'll, I'll kind of flip back to you to talk about the automation. Yeah, thanks, Chris. So, <clears throat> you know, we've talked a lot about, you know, these processes conceptually, whether we've driven them through a framework or talk about the ecosystem of the organizations that we need to deal with. Uh, but back to the title of the presentation itself and how are we leveraging automation? You know, what's different, you, you know, about this idea of convergence of risk and spend management um, or the overall management of supplier performance and risk management in a single unified platform? Well, this graphic is a representation of Coupa's um, overall, uh, overall um, architecture and solutions together. And we're focusing in on supplier management. And Chris just walked you through kind of a process flow, and I showed you a circular diagram as well. Well, what we're talking about, and you know, to use Chris's term, how do we react at the speed of sound? And well, these applications need to communicate, they need to be unified, and what it really looks like is can our supplier performance and risk management solutions provide this continual pulse, or can we communicate information from one module to the next? And certainly within Coupa, we can. What we're talking about is taking risk indicators and pushing them directly to our strategic sourcing team so they can immediately take risk and performance uh, into consideration as they're going through a strategic sourcing event. How can we then take that information once a contract has been put in place and actually <clears throat> provide information through into our procurement teams so then they can take action directly on a particular supplier? really what we want to do is be able to control the transactions, right? If a certain threshold is met from a risk or performance standpoint, I may want to put that supplier in the penalty box. I no longer want to allow requisitions for that supplier or an invoice for that supplier, right? It wasn't very long ago when we thought matching a PO to an invoice to a receipt was clever, or we were trying to get all invoices to be done electronically. Well, now we need to go way beyond that. And the signals that we operate our businesses by that are key to driving resilience in our business need to be active and they need to be in real time. And this is a diagram <clears throat> that should help you get there. This type of information needs to flow seamlessly from and within our organization. And what does that look like? Well, this is a rendering um, of a dashboard where really what you're trying to do is really drive the value of your supplier relationships through automation. Right? I should be able to consolidate these things you know, into one dashboard for my end users to take action. 
And what we're really talking about here is the scorecards and the benchmarks in combination with end user ratings that could be coming from the Coupa community, driving specific prescriptive actions because we're not experts in everything, right? One of us is nowhere near as smart as all of us. So let's have some suggestions be presented to us. And then let's get an overall supplier health score combined into one dashboard. And physically, these things look just like this. This is an actual snapshot of a real dashboard. And if you look down in the bottom right-hand corner you know, of, this, of this screenshot, what you're seeing is how to put a supplier on hold based on actual data that is occurring in real time. So this is where we want to get you, right? This is really what these frameworks and these ecosystems are talking about. It's getting us to the reality of convergence of risk and spend management and putting control you know, into the individuals who need it when they need it. Chris? Perfect. Yep, absolutely. So, so we, we've given I know we've, we've given you a lot of information today, right? We, uh, you know, Sam and I have talked about you know automation and big data and end user experience and supplier experience. So, we, we wanted to to kind of leave you with with a, with a, a couple of takeaways and a couple of key messages. And when when I'm in with clients, you know, designing their supplier risk and performance management programs, there, there's typically three things that I would say to them, but like, look guys, if, if you get these three things right, it, it, it won't be Nirvana, but it will certainly, you know, stand you up for success because these, these are where we see things, you know, kind of going wrong or, or just, you know, having some challenges around kind of implementing the program. So, so just, just kind of take these three kind of three thoughts as, as kind of three, you know, kind of components that I just want to kind of leave you guys with. So when we think about intake, like get, spend some time, and get the intake process right. Naturally, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the end-to-end -end process in a sec, but that intake process at the beginning and the initial risk assessment, I can't stress enough like how important it is to get that right and make sure that's calibrated right. If it's calibrated wrong, it's gonna create you know, significant work for, for a lot of people in the organization. You know, We've already talked about the cross-functional nature of these programs. So it's not only gonna create significant work, but it's, it's probably busy work, right? So, so spend the time to, to kind of get that intake process right and really think about the end user experience, really think about the training, really think about the change management, really think about the operating model that's, that's ultimately gonna support your investment and in, in technology. Then, then think about the kind of workflow in terms of the automation and the workflows. Spend a good amount of time, you know, getting that end-to-end -end process right. Understand the key points within the process that the tool is going to operate, that is going to, sorry, automate. And then obviously, obviously understand any points that they're not going to be able to automate. So that there naturally will still be, you know, what I would call humans in the loop. Um, so, so think about, you know, where those humans in the loop are and make sure that they're actually kind of adding value to the process, right? So. So spend a good amount of time, you know, kind of understanding um, and getting that process right, especially with all the different groups that we've talked about, right? All the kind of second line defense and the risk domain owners. Like that's, that, that's really important. And then your inventory and register, because, because as everybody knows, someone in your organization, typically someone in the C-suite or one of your executives is gonna come along and be like, hey, do we, do we like have a list of like all our high risk third parties and you know, what risks they're carrying? And you don't want to be the, the, the person that says no, right? You, you, you want to be able to, to answer that question in a positive way and, say, and, and think about, you know, how do we get that kind of push button reporting? That means it's like, yeah, sure, of course we do. Like I can, you know, I can send you a report today that'll give you, you know, that, that kind of key information and that kind of key data. So, yeah, I just wanted to leave you with those thoughts about kind of, you know, three key things that we see as being critical that, that, that will really help you kind of stand up your supply risk and, and performance management program. Them. Well, and, yeah, and, and when we do get it right, right, when, when we adhere to, you know, the principles that Chris has been outlining, how do we know, right, how do we actually measure, you know, success in these types of programs? You know, well, there are obviously these metrics continue to evolve, um, but, you know, what we've seen, you know, in our current client base and what, how we drive success and make sure that we've got some tangible benchmarks to go after, you know, are around you know, leveraging the automation from a digitization standpoint, right? How digital are we? Can we get to these 90% thresholds? You know, so if you're still using spreadsheets in any area of your business regarding performance or risk management, um, you can't maybe eliminate all of them, but we should be trying to eliminate 90% plus of them. And then how fast are we getting through the cycle, right? How quickly can we actually do an assessment? 
How fast do your, do your suppliers respond to the assessments that we send them? Well, we're seeing this down you know, into the 80 hour range. And then how do you measure efficiency? Well, one metric is really the ratio of the number of suppliers that are managed by one of your supplier relationship managers. Right? Now, you may have one-to-one -one for an extremely critical relationship, but what we're seeing is the movement of that type of one-to-one -one or 10-to-one or 20-to-one to now into the range of 100 to one of third parties being managed by a particular relationship manager because of the automation, because we have things like automatic segmentation, because we're doing scorecards electronically, we can drive these levels of efficiency way up. And then in the advent that we do find an issue or we have to create an action plan to resolve or remediate a finding, how quickly are we doing that? Well, things that used to take months you know, are now down into the hourly range where we can get things into a 90 hour range to actually remediate some type of finding or match that we have. So these are some success metrics, you know, that hopefully we can all shoot for, you know, in our programs. Um, <clears throat> and you can compare yourself to maybe what you're doing things today. Um, but I know on behalf of myself, all of Coupa, Chris, and all of KPMG, we really wanted to thank you all uh, for listening to us today, for attending the webinar. And Michael, I think we've got plenty of time uh, for some questions. We absolutely do. Thank you so much, Chris and Sam. Um, I do want to remind everybody in the audience, if you haven't had a chance to get your questions in, you still can hit that Ask a Question button on your console. Otherwise, we're going to dive right in uh, because a couple of questions have, in fact, come in from the audience. Um, Let's start with a question for Sam, I think. Which industries are doing a good job of managing third-party risk? Well, I, I don't know if, if you could say one is doing a better job than the other, but I can tell you that um, the financial services industry as a whole, um, I think, got a head start on other industries, mainly because um, the government regulators mandated it, right? So if we go back, you know, 10 years ago to some of the financial crises that we faced, right, the financial regulators got involved and basically mandated all financial services organizations, specifically anyone with a bank charter, that they had to put in place a comprehensive uh, performance and, mis and risk management program. All right, but I would also argue that these concepts have been around for a long time. Talk to any discrete or process manufacturer, um, and they will give you um, a good education on supply chain risk management. Right? The changes now are it goes beyond traditional supply chain, right? and we need to take into consideration many more aspects like crisis management, you know, things that we're facing today um, that we didn't have to face you know, in recent history. So I would say I would say this <clears throat> from an industry perspective, the financial services may have been the, the first industry to really drive change, um, but um, I think it's closely followed, certainly by manufacturers in the high tech space as well. Chris, you, you know, you may you know you deal with a lot of different organizations um, across industry. Um, maybe you've got uh, you know, other things to add there. Yeah, I know, Sam. I'd, I'd agree 100. percent Yeah, I think I think financial services, right? Because the, the the 2013 regulations came down on a lot of the banks, and you know, it it wasn't a it wasn't a nice to have. It was a you you must have, or else, um, you know, you're you're going to have some issues. So so yeah, I think I think a lot of you know they they they've been kind of kind of leading the charge a little bit in that perspective. And then I think um you know we we we've all seen some very high profile cases of you know mishaps, particularly with customer data. Um, especially when they're held with third parties. Um, so I, I've spent, you know, a lot of time, and as I say, in the technology and, and kind of telecom sectors, because um, there has been, you know, some 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 hiccups, let's say, within those particular areas. And um, so I think they're, you know, they're they're catching up at a at a pretty rapid pace. Um, but again, anyone with with kind of manufacturing, you know, type uh, operations, um, where they're producing, you know, product. And um, then, yeah, I would agree with Sam that, that, that your know, supply chain risk has always been, uh, you know, stretching back many, you know, many, many years, um, has always been a, a, a kind of key concept. Um, but we're, we're just seeing it being kind of more acute now than, than kind of ever. And ultimately, you know, the, the technology um, is now giving us that opportunity to, um, to really ramp up these efforts. 
Yeah, and I think one of the things that you know we certainly see is, is that that goes across industry is really what we need to be aware of and where our efforts need to be focused in terms of a domain. Right. So, you know, historically, as Chris was mentioning, we were talking about a lot of financial services regulations. Uh, and then recently, uh, you know, government started enforcing anti bribery and corruption laws. Right. So the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act or the UK Bribery Act now have a lot of teeth. Right. There's significant monetary fines, but also civil penalties. So what would be the next area? Right. Well, um, you know, in Europe and in Australia, there's a lot of activity around the Modern Slavery Act. Will that be the next regulation, you know, that really has teeth when it's enforced? Right? Certainly, if we're not adhering to the guidelines of a regulation like that, um, we can suffer significant reputational damage. And we want to be aware, um, you know, of those types of labor laws um, where we're not being um, as responsible as we should be. Right. So I would encourage, you know, everyone on the webinar to start to consider, uh, you know, within your own businesses, you know, where your emphasis and energy should be. You know, is it in sustainability? You know, is it in financial health responsibility? You know, information security is always important. Um, but I think we need to be on the lookout on the forefront of where the regula regulations are, are coming from um, and the type of regulations, you know, that we're facing uh, in order to be prepared. Um, thank you. Actually, I, I feel like one of the questions that's come in kind of dovetails very neatly off what you were just saying, Sam. Uh, and the question is supplier diversity, uh, which is something that can be embedded into procurement, procurement and responsible sourcing, as well as inclusion and diversity programs. Um, so I mean, obviously that's a, that's a pretty hot topic for companies of late. Um, but can Coupa risk aware? track supplier diversity and supplier certifications? Uh, that's a very you know, specific question around a product, but let's, let's you know, take it above a, you know, a product standpoint and you know, talk about supplier diversity in general. And you know, the short answer is yes, uh, you know, products need to be able to take into consideration uh, you know, diversity information around our suppliers. You know, whether you know, it's, it's minority owned or women owned and really through that um, relationship as well, because I may think I'm dealing with a diverse supplier, but in reality, what I want to know is how many diverse suppliers that they're utilizing as well. Um, so I know at Coupa, a lot of that will depend on, you know, the community intelligence information that we have. Um, and that information is getting stronger and stronger all the time. Uh, in fact, uh, a, a recent company that we've acquired, um, sole focus is around uh, supplier information um, specific to diversity. And that is essentially why, you know, we're entering in that space because we want to get stronger uh, in terms of being able to provide these prescriptive solutions around, you know, the diverse, uh, diverse suppliers. Um, so, yes, it can be measured, um, you know, within Coupa and within our solutions, um, and you'll see a continued emphasis, uh, emphasis from us. Thank you so much. Uh, taking the focus back to risk management, um, the question that's come in is, my organization has a business spend management solution, but we don't have a risk management plan yet. Can I integrate risk management with business spend management? And if so, how would that address common third-party risks that organizations face, organizations like mine face? Yeah, so, so let me take that one conceptually from sure. like in a program setup. So, so, so yeah, I mean, having having that business spend management and and you know having the the, the, the kind of tool um, to support that, yeah, is is absolutely critical and in a great first step. Um, and yeah, we would we would as we kind of talked about a little bit on the the process integration piece as you're kind of building out that capability and building out um, your maturity within that particular space. Then I would I would certainly think that supplier risk and performance management should be one of those key components that you're looking to integrate and thinking about like how are you on, you're going to integrate it. So so again it comes comes down to that concept of actually sizing kind of what that program is going to look like. So understanding you know what what is what is my kind of universe look like. And where can I add value to the organization through, um, you know, the performance and risk management efforts to make sure 
that they are fully integrated with the, the kind of business spend management, you know, process and operating model. Um, so it's it's key to make sure that 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 you're 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 think it's good that you're thinking about that now before you actually kind of launch your program. But again, I would just kind of think about how how are those different components of the program. So kind of like the framework that we we kind of showed you earlier on. How are those components all going to fit together? And just place a particular importance on the kind of process and particularly the kind of front end of that process around intake. You know, how how are you actually going to risk you know, risk assess those suppliers? How's that one going to integrate with your your business spend management initiative? You know, and then who's who's going to do it, right? So that's also going to be one of the the kind of key components. Sam, any thoughts on that? No, I, agreed. And you know, there are you know a lot of solutions that represent you know standalone you know supplier risk management solutions, and you know, Coupa provides one of them. You know, that can be standalone as well. Um, but obviously, ideally, we're looking for that unified platform. Otherwise, you know, you're faced with integration challenges. But don't let that dissuade you, right? I really look at integration as, you know, table stakes. We all need to do it, right? It's, you know, but how tightly unified are the products is really what you need to be aware of. And, and you know, how quickly is your platform of choice, you know, getting to that, you know, unified state versus integrated state. Um, but clearly, there are, you know, plenty of choices for you. Um, we, we certainly hope you would take, uh, you know, Coupa um, into consideration when you go through that. Um, but as Chris points out, most importantly, it's, you know, setting up the program correctly um, and identifying where those touch points are. All right, great. Um, so while we're talking, a couple of questions came in uh, that specifically talk about, uh, you know, managing risk at the onboarding stage versus ongoing risk assessment. So uh, we're just going to sort of uh, con agglomerate the questions and present them this way. Is there a point of view on managing supplier risk at the phase of onboarding the supplier versus ongoing risk assessment through the life cycle of the supplier? Yeah, I, I, yeah, that's, that's actually a really good question. So, so yeah, and I also, uh, Michael, I think the other question about you know the importance of of kind of you know balance and also the the kind of upfront initial risk assessment and the ongoing monitoring. So, so yeah, take to absolutely take the point around that. I think I think the point we were trying to make was around that initial risk assessment process and the intake process is going to drive a lot of activity on the back end, right? So, if if we don't get the the initial risk assessment process right at the front end, then we may not get the segmentation right, and that segmentation may be driving our cadence. So, so let me give you a, a kind of really practical example. Um, you know, if, if we're setting up uh, supplier risk management programs, it may be, and, and we've worked with clients on this, but it may be we look at the segmentation model and say, okay, for, for critical, um, you know, we're, we're going to put certain risk alerts in place, but we're also going to do a refresh on the due diligence maybe every kind of six to 12 months. And then for high, we're going to do maybe every kind of 12 to 18 and for, you know, medium and so on and so forth. You guys get the idea of kind of where I'm going with that. So it, it's important to make sure that we get the upfront piece, right? Because obviously that, that creates workflow and creates work on the, on the back end. So making sure that we get that right and also, also creates work in terms of when we think about our operating model around who's actually going to do that work. Is it, is it a supplier risk team within the procurement function? Is it a more kind of federated model? So it's, it's like supplier managers within the business. So again, it, it just, it, it drives a whole bunch of questions and a whole bunch of, um, you know, conversation around how that's actually going to happen from a, a kind of operating model perspective. So, so yeah, not to, not to downplay the, the kind of ongoing monitoring. It is super important. And particular, as, as Sam and I have talked about, and, and again, especially in the current environment, the proactive monitoring so not just waiting for, you know, r reports to come in that are kind of three months out of date. That's, that's not going to be kind of good enough anymore. It's about trying to drive a level of proactivity around your supply base. Um, but, yeah, absolutely. I, the, the one comment I'd, ma I'd make is it's, it's all connected, right? It, it's all got to work together, you know, seamlessly to make sure that, that, that you get the best out of your program. Yeah, and Chris, I would just add that one of the reasons why I really enjoy having the opportunity to speak to predominantly a lot of procurement and sourcing professionals is because you are in a line of business that's horizontal, and it cuts across all the other lines of businesses 
you know, within the organization. And you're in a unique position to standardize or drive standardization around the onboarding process. And onboarding, you know, can mean a lot of things, but what I'm referring to is the beginning of the onboarding process. Really, you know, where a requisition for a new good or service starts, how I standardize that process, and then actually perform the appropriate type of risk, right? And without that standardization, it's very difficult to break down the traditional silos and to get transparency across the business, right? So Chris, in the beginning of the presentation, you know, talked a lot about how procurement is changing and what needs to happen and the opportunities for procurement professionals. And this is really where it stands out, right? Procurement professionals can stand up and say, this is where the process needs to begin. We need to standardize kind of the tip of the sphere on how we begin the onboarding process. And when we do that, we can capture the appropriate information, apply the appropriate business rules, segment accordingly, and then create the right type of due diligence roster to be executed. Is it information security? Is it financial health and viability? Do we need to do sustainability? Is GDPR a regulation that needs to be into consideration here? What are the due diligence that needs to be done? Right? And that's really, I think, a great opportunity for procurement professionals today is to take a leadership role in spearheading these types of initiatives. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I would like to point out that we are approaching the top of the hour, so we probably only have time for one or two more questions. Um, Chris, let's ask this question to you. Where do companies normally fail in implementing supplier risk management? That's a really good question, Michael. Um, can I, how, how long is a better string on this one? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the, the, the key components, so we've, we've talked about intake, um, we've talked a lot about process. I, I think also, it, it kind of just building on Sam's point there around um, the kind of procurement organization, but more more generally, just just the organization that, that supports supplier risk. Um, I think that's one of the, the, the kind of key components that, that we see organizations kind of having challenges with. Now, one of, one of the areas that, that sometimes organizations struggle with conceptually is kind of like, well, okay, you know, I, yes, I want to stand up a supplier risk program, and yes, I want to bring on a, a, you know, an integrated technology solution, but what's my ROI? Like, what's my return on investment? Um, and it can be difficult sometimes, right, to, to, to kind of quantify, you know, exactly what is, what is the ROI for not hitting a risk? What is the ROI, you know, for not getting on, on the kind of news websites and the, and the newspapers, if anyone still reads the newspaper these days, um, in terms of, you know, with, with bad press, et cetera, because something has, you know, something has went wrong. So that, that can sometimes be, be, be some of the, the, the kind of pushing the pull on this. Um, but I think just getting that operating model right around how is it, how is it ultimately going to work? Who's going to do the work? Um, you know, where are the kind of key activities kind of taking place? What is that kind of line of defense model look like and getting all those different kind of risk domain experts lined up and make sure their process lines up. And then the one point that, that, that I love that Sam made was around measuring the performance of your program. If, if, if you're taking, you know, six months to get a low risk supplier, you know, kind of through your risk assessment process, then something is, something is going wrong, right? So, so trying to measure the process and go out and survey your end users. Like, ask end users, like, how are we doing, like, internally? You'd be amazed at the, the insights that that will be able to, to, to kind of bring to, you know, a supplier risk management function or area or, you know, whatever we want to call it. So, so yeah, just a, just a couple of things there that I would, I would kind of focus on in terms of, you know, get those things right, and, and I think everything else then, you know, starts to, to hopefully fall into place. Dan, did you have anything to add? No, I think we'll close on that. That was fantastic, Chris. I agree. Well, all right. In that case, uh, that does bring us to the end of our allotted time. And I, as I mentioned, if we haven't had a chance to answer your question live, we will definitely respond via email. So we hope you've enjoyed the presentation. If you'd like to pass the link along to a colleague or you'd like to come back and revisit it and listen again, uh, it'll be up and ready and available on demand within 48 hours. And I'd like to thank our sponsors, Coupa and KMG. I'm sorry, KPMG. 
And uh, I encourage everybody to hit that uh, related resources widget on your viewing console if you'd like to get any more information about the risk management solutions that we've been talking about. So Sam and Chris, I want to thank you for sharing your expertise with us. My name is Michael Steinhardt for CBS Interactive, and I hope everybody has a great day. Thanks, everyone.